Yaakov Avinu goes to marry Rachel, and he brokers a deal with Lovin. Lovin says, work seven years. Yaakov agrees. At the end of those seven years, he goes to marry Rachel. He finds out instead it's Leah. Work another seven years. And after 14 years of diligent, hard labor, Yaakov Avinu was penniless. He says to Lovin, now it's time for me to take care of my family. Lovin says, don't leave. They agree, make a certain agreement. And for the next six years, <clears throat> Yaakov Avinu works with a certain agreement that the proceeds or part of the proceeds goes to his own household. Ve'yifros ha'ish ma'od ma'od, Yaakov became extraordinarily wealthy. He had flocks, he had servants, he had tremendous, tremendous wealth. He leaves Lovin's house and he goes out to go back home and he hears the words that his brother Esav is coming to greet him with 400 men armed to murder Yaakov. Yaakov first davens and then he prepares an elaborate gift, a huge gift, 200 sheep, 200 goat, and with an entire elaborate procedure, he sends it wave after wave, then he himself bows down seven times, and eventually it works, and he appeases Esav, and in fact, they hug and embrace. But it's the wording of Esav and Yaakov at that moment that's particularly eye-opening. Esav says to his brother, after receiving this tremendous gift, Yeshli Rav Achi, I have tremendous abundance. My brother, why have you given me this, this huge amount of wealth? I have plenty and plenty. I don't need. Keep it for yourself. And Yaakov says back, please, no, no, no. Take it. It will be my honor if you would take it. Ki Hanani Elokim, Hashem granted me gifts. Vichi Yeshli Kol, and I have everything. Now, if you study that exchange, it sounds like Esav is bragging. You don't have to give me anything. I have tons. Yeshli Rav. I have tremendous abundance. But it also sounds like Yaakov is bragging to a much greater extent. Yeshli Kol. I have everything. Not only do I have what you have, you brag about having a lot. I have everything. And it sounds like Yaakov Avinu is arrogant, boastful, and it doesn't sound appropriate. Rashi explains that when Yaakov said, Yeshli Kol, I have everything, it wasn't in a manner of being conceited, it wasn't boastful. He meant to say, I have everything that I need. All of my needs I have taken care of. Esav, on the other hand, he was bragging. Yeshli Rav, Yosef, Yosef, I have abundance more and more than even I need. And explains Rashi, Esav was bragging, Yaakov wasn't. And this is a very interesting Rashi, but the only problem is, it doesn't seem to fit the Pasuk. Meaning, it's very nice to try to defend the Avos, but Rashi's job is to explain to us Pshat, and it sure does sound like Esav might be bragging, Yeshli Rav, I have a lot, I have abundance, but Yaakov is bragging even more. I have everything. And it'd be wonderful to say that what he meant by that was, I have all that I need, but where do you see that? You don't see that in the exchange. You don't see that in the words. What Yaakov said was, I have everything. And it sure does sound that to mean I have extraordinary amounts. It sounds like he's bragging. It'd be wonderful if Rashi is right, that it means I have everything that I need. But what right do you have to say that that's in fact what Yaakov Avinu was saying? And I'd like to see if we could better understand this Rashi, because I believe it actually teaches us a fundamental life principle. And to understand it, let me begin with a preface. And this may sound like a very bold statement, and it might be, but I believe it's 100% true. And at the end of our session today, I hope that you will not only agree, but you'll understand it to be absolutely factual and basic to the human being. Here is that bold statement. You cannot love money and be happy. You just can't do it. You can love cigars and be happy. You can love dogs and be happy. You can love classical music and be happy. But you cannot love money and be happy. You have a choice in life. Either you're happy and you don't love money, or you love money and you're not happy. But those two things, loving money and happiness, cannot go together. Now, why is that? So to understand why that statement is true, 
we really have to dig into the human personality a bit more. We have to understand what makes a human being tick. And let's begin with a pasuk that might be eye-opening. The wisest of all men, Shlomo HaMelech, tells us in Koheles, Ohev kesef lo yispa kesef. One who loves money will never be satisfied with money. Now, that's a rather curious statement. And one who loves money will never be satisfied. No matter how much money you have, if you love money, it's not going to be enough. Now, you might ask, why is that true? Why does it necessarily mean that you can have an unquenchable, insatiable desire for money? Listen, I could love steak. Doesn't mean I'm always hungry for steak. I could love tennis. It doesn't mean I have to play tennis every day. Why does Shlomo Melech say that if you love money, you'll have an unquenchable, insatiable desire for money? Listen, I got a million dollars. All right, that's enough. Ten million dollars. Okay, let, let's make it better. A billion dollars. A billion dollars should be enough for most of us. Do you know what a billion dollars is? If you have a billion dollars, let's say someone leaves you a nice little Yerusha, one billion dollars. If you were to spend a thousand dollars a day, it'll take you 2,700 years to spend that billion dollars. Let me make it a little bit more clear. If you had a billion dollars and you spent 10 million dollars a year, it would take you a hundred years to spend that money. Most of us can manage to get by on 10 million a year. Why is it an axiomatic principle that if you love money, you will never have enough? It'll be an insatiable desire. You'll have to have more and more. And to begin our understanding of money and the human, we have to begin with the understanding of the human. You see, modern man is very, very much aware of many, many things. And modern man has much knowledge at his fingertips. And astonishingly, the only area that modern man doesn't understand is man. And as much as psychologists and as much as social scientists try to understand man, there is very, very little that they truly understand about the human. And if you'd like to understand one of the basics why, Let me just focus on one little observation. Mazda has a commercial now where they talk about the Jimba Itai. Jimba Itai was the motto, the credo of a certain type of samurai. In the Japanese culture, a samurai is a warrior. Some of these samurais were mounted on horseback and were archers. They would shoot arrows from on top of the horse. But to be perfect at your skill, to be a really gifted samurai shooting arrows from on top of the horse, you had a problem. Because you see, to hold a bow and arrow, you need one hand to hold the bow, other hand to pull back the arrow. Now, how are you going to do that marching at full speed and accurately shoot? So you had to learn to be one with the horse. Jinbai Tai is the concept that the soldier, the samurai, is one with the horse. And you could see magnificent examples of people shooting arrows, riding without holding on, and they seem to have that flow one with the horse. Okay, an interesting concept. So let's go back to the 1600s, and let's imagine we see a samurai, and he's working, and he's training, and he really, really works at being one with his horse. So much so that he thinks about what his horse needs, what his horse likes to eat, what his horse needs for his blanket, and he prepares for war, and he prepares for his horse everything, the food, the blankets, and he sets out to war. Only one little problem. He forgot to take food for himself. He forgot to take blankets for himself. He's so focused on the horse that he forgot about him. If you'd like to know why modern man understands so little about us, about me, it's for one simple reason. They're focused on the horse, and they forget that there's another part called me. You see, I am comprised of two components. There is a nefesh abahami. There's an animal soul within man. The human being was given the very same nefesh as every sort of animal in the wild kingdom. That nefesh takes care of all of its needs. That nefesh has been pre-programmed to desire all of the things that are needed to keep the human being alive. But there's also another part of me called the neshama. I am this mix. When I think, when I go through my day, I have two different components. There's my nefesh abahami, my animal soul with its desires and needs and hungers. But there's another part called me. And I believe that this is one of the most liberating, enlightening concepts that you could ever envision. And that is that I occupy this body. 
You see, I am not the body. I am not defined by the body. I am the one inside. I'm in this body temporarily. I wear this coat. And I'll grant you that because I'm in this body, I have different needs and different appetites and different desires, and I'm ever confused, but it's I who am inside this body. And the reason why that's the most enlightening, liberating thought that a human being can ever come to is because once you get that, you begin to understand what makes you tick. You begin to understand that there are two dimensions, two diverse parts, each with their needs, each with their appetites, each with desires. And while modern man has spent a tremendous amount of effort to understand the horse's needs, it seems that he has long ago forgotten about the other part of me, what I certainly hope is the most integral, most important part of me. And amazingly, you can find people who are very, very learned in taking care of their animal needs, and they can have all kinds of degrees after their names, but they can't for some reason get man to be happy. And it could be a psychologist, like a psychotherapist, it could be a there, it can be whatever it can be, and it can maybe deal with some issues, maybe anxieties, maybe depression, but this thing called happiness, what is wrong? Why can't we get this man to be happy? And the first step in the problem is because you don't have a clue about what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a horse, you forgot about the rider, and guess what? If you spend your lifetime feeding the horse, taking care of all of the horse's needs, that's very impressive and a very good thing to do, but if you don't take care of the needs of the neshama, the I, guess what? You're going to be very, very empty. And just as the body has needs, so too does the neshama have needs. The body's needs are clear. You need to eat. If you don't eat, you're going to be hungry, you're going to be weak, you're going to see the results. But just as your body, that horse, has very real needs, so too does your neshama. Would you like to see one of the most obvious and glaring needs of the neshama? There used to be an advertisement for powdered milk. And this particular brand of powdered milk bragged to be better than the rest. Why? Because we only take milk from contented cows. Our cows are content and our milk is better because we take milk from contented cows. Now, I do believe that you will find any cow any cow is content. Put Elsie the cow in that field, give her some grass, and she is content. She doesn't need more. She doesn't aspire for more. She doesn't sit there breaking down the fence. How can I get more grass and more grass and more grass? And if you look throughout the animal kingdom, you will find that every single animal, once its needs are met, once it has what it needs to survive, to eat, to procreate, whatever it needs. Once its needs are met, it is content. But man, and man alone, long after he has all of his needs met, is not content. He's just not satisfied, and he needs more and more and more. The king who rules over an entire continent must have another continent. More, I have to have more. And you'll find the human being, no matter what he's into, no matter what he's focused on, will never be satisfied, will never be content. The Arch HaSadikim explains to us, do you know why? Because that is the neshama of man. That is man's soul. You see, the body was created with its nefesh, with its needs to keep it in existence, to allow it to do what it should do so too the neshama was created with all of its needs to do what it was created to do. The body was created to exist, and its nefesh was created with all of the needs and appetites to keep it alive, to eat, to drink, to rest, procreate, etc. But the neshama was put here to do a very different job. The neshama was put into the human to grow, to accomplish, to change the essence of it, to reach ever higher levels. And when you see a human being who's never content, the reason why is because his neshama is never satisfied. 
And I was put on this planet to grow higher and higher, more and more. And there are real needs within me, within my neshama. If I satisfy them properly, I reach some level of contentment. But if I subvert those needs, if I focus them towards the wrong intent, I'll drink and drink, fill and fill, and never be satisfied. And if you'd like to see this in action, just study the human. No matter what age, no matter what stage, he needs to get to the next. How do you train a kid to, to, to be toilet trained? Moishi, if you stop wearing diapers, you can wear tzitzits like the big boys. And the little boy needs to be like the big boys. And once he's a teenager, he needs to be like the older. The businessman always needs to make more money. The author always needs to write the next bestseller. The executive is never satisfied with vice president. I have to climb the ladder and go even higher. The politician is never satisfied with, listen, I'm a mayor of a city, not so bad, right? I need to be the governor. I need to be a senator. And everyone always aspires for more and more and more. And why is that? Explains the Archa Sadiqim, that's the neshama of man. A drive to improve, a drive for the next level, a drive to get higher. We were given that drive for a purpose, for me to really grow, for me to become really significantly greater and bigger. If I use that drive properly, I in fact do just that. But the need is there. And if I use it incorrectly, it'll be something that will drive me for whatever I'm into for more and more and more, and I will never be satisfied. Would you like to understand why the human being can never, ever be satisfied? It's because he's trying to fill himself with the wrong substance. There was a novel I read a number of years ago. It was about a young black fellow who grew up in the South in the 1920s in America, and he describes poverty. But he says poverty then wasn't just hunger. Poverty meant he was always hungry. He would go to bed at night hungry, wake up in the morning hungry, because there was never enough food. And one day on the way to school, he passed a neighbor's house, and his stomach was bothering him, and he found a solution. There was a spigot, a garden hose. He opened the spigot and began drinking and drinking. He filled his belly, filled his belly as much as he could with water, and it helped. It sated the hunger pangs. His hunger no longer bothered him. Until not long thereafter when the water left him and he was more hungry than he was before. If you'd like to understand why modern man is fundamentally unhappy, it's because if you're going to pursue everything but what you actually need, it's like drinking when you're hungry. And your neshama craves growing, real accomplishments. We're given a Torah with a very specific method and methodology of reaching greatness. And even if you're not Jewish, there are various steps and various procedures to become truly a great human being. But within the human being is a need to grow, and that need is never satisfied. If you focus it on things that are outside, things that are external to you, if your growth is measured by how many books you write, how much money you have, how famous you are, you'll pursue and pursue and pursue, but always be hungry because you're not sating that need. That need is for fundamental growth, to change the essence of me, to change myself into a giving, caring person, to make myself into a great human being. And if you try to fill that need with anything but real growth, you're going to be ever hungry, ever hungry, never satisfied, and that is the human being. Unlike Elsie the cow who is content, the human being will never be content unless he understands why he's here, unless he grows appropriately. And while that voice inside, that neshama, can drive a person to constantly need more, it could also drive a person to something else. You will not find a single animal, an entire animal kingdom, that is boastful, proud, or overbearing. And even when we use such phrases about the peacock <clears throat> showing off his feathers, he is not doing it out of pride. He's doing it to attract the female. But that concept of status, of honor, position, 
that drives man crazy, that people give up their entire life for, does not exist in the animal kingdom. And would you like to know why not? Because it does not come from the nefesh of Bahami. It does not come from the animal soul of man. There's nothing in my animal soul that demands being a famous person, being a person of status. There's nothing within the nefesh of Bahami, within the animal soul of man, that demands being above other people. But there is something else that drives that. And that something else is my neshama. You see, within me is a neshama that comes from under the Kisei HaKavah, that comes from under Hashem's throne of glory. And I was put in this world to be truly great. And I understand at the core of my essence what real greatness is. And at the core of my essence, I understand that Hashem would have created the entire world for me and me alone. And therefore, there is a voice within me that says, why aren't you great? Why aren't you accomplishing? Why aren't you doing really great things? And ultimately, I have a choice. I either answer that voice by saying, you're right, I'm nobody, I'm nothing. And many people end up destroying their sense of self because of that. Or there's an alternative. What do you mean? I am great. Do you know who I am? I am so great. I am important and I'm smart and I'm clever and I'm talented and I'm good looking. Do you know who I am? But you see, there's a voice within me that demands being answered. Why aren't you great? Why aren't you doing great things? Why aren't you being really significant and doing tremendous things? And if I answer that voice by saying, I am great, I am greater, I am greater, I'm going to end up in an ever increasing, ever more demanding, inflated sense of self. And that's what we call arrogance. That's gaiva. Gaiva comes from the unmet greatness of the human being. When my neshama says, why aren't you really great? And I say, I am. Look at me. I'm important and weighty and mighty. Do you know how important I am? And I self-inflate. That is another manifestation of arrogance. And once I start going down that path, I grow and I grow. My head becomes swelled and more swelled and more swelled than that until eventually the entire world is not big enough for me. But let's take one more step. If we now understand that the neshama constantly needs to grow, and we also understand that if you don't feed it right, it's going to lead to malcontent, to ever being ha- unhappy, to ever needing more. And we also understand that the neshama has this desire to be great. And if I miss answer that desire, I self-inflate, there's one more step that we need to understand. And let me begin this step with a question. How is it possible to love money? A very simple question. How is it possible to love money? And let me explain what I mean. I understand how you can love that which money buys. Listen, if I have a lot of money, I could buy all kinds of stuff. I like nice things. I like very nice things. So if I have a lot, a lot of money, I could buy all kinds of stuff. But you see, I don't love money then. I love all these things. Maybe it's luxuries. Maybe it's uh, all kinds of wonderful toys. and ga- I, I get that. I understand how you could love material possessions. But money is the vehicle to get to it. How do you love money? Well, maybe you'll say to me, well, I love money because I love covet. I love status. If I have a lot of money, people treat me with covet. Oh, a rich man. So again, you don't love money. You love status. But how is it possible to love money? And I'd like to share with you exactly how it happens. Let's imagine for a minute that uh, I'm a regular person, you know, regular, plain, live much, much of my life that way. And suddenly I get a letter from a lawyer that I have a rich uncle in Utah that I never knew about, and he left me a billion dollars. And in fact, I check it out, it's real, and I now am the proud inheritor of one billion dollars. Okay, what happens to me? So initially, I will be exactly the same person I always was. I'm a regular guy, now with lots of discretionary income, I got lots of money I can think about what to do with, but I'm exactly the same person as I always was, I am here, and the money is here. I'm a guy, a regular guy with strengths, talents, 
abilities, and I also happen to have a billion dollars. Wonderful. But a funny thing starts happening. People start treating me a little bit different. You ever notice that once somebody has a little bit of money, well, all of a sudden, first of all, uh, everyone is going to come by. Every yeshiva in North America is going to ask me to be an honoree at their dinner. And of course, Atzala has a big project coming up. But it's not just that. People start treating me with a lot of respect. There was once a man I knew very well, who at the age of 40, was what we would call, unfortunately, a Yutzlach. He could not hold down a job, and he, he was really financially distraught. It happened to be that his father was very wealthy, and when his father died, there was quite a Yerusha, and I said to my wife, just watch. Just watch how smart he's going to become now. Everybody used to make fun of him. Everyone used to mock him. Oh, now it's, it's Reb Shmiel. Oh, Mr. Goldstein. Oh, can I ask your opinion? Can I ask you... The minute I have a dollar to my name, people start respecting me. They start asking all kinds of questions. They assume, oh, a rich man must be an expert in this and that. And all of a sudden, people start treating me differently. And I begin to enjoy this little different, you know. I'm not really just the the same as everybody else, you know. After all, I walk in the room and everybody looks at me. And I go to a chas and everybody's paying attention to me, you know. And I've been thinking about it. You know, for me to drive the same kind of car as you, that's not really pas. And for me to wear the same kind of suit as you, uh, it's not really, uh, you know, so simple. And as I go down that path, I become just a little bit more different, a little bit more different until I become a wealthy man. I am a rich man. And as a rich man, I'm different than you. I'm not in the same league as you. I'm just, I don't know how to say this. I'm just, I'm rich. You're poor. I'm, I'm a rich guy. And as a rich guy, I, uh, I do things differently. I think differently. I'm just different than you because I'm a rich guy. And that's exactly when I'm in desperate, dire straits. You see, I could have a billion dollars as long as that money is outside of me. I'm not arrogant and I'm not in danger of being arrogant. But once I identify with the attribute, once it's not money that I have, but I am a rich guy, now all of a sudden... I start inflating because you should know something. A guy like me, a rich guy, is different than you, is above the average sort of person, deservant of more respect. After all, I'm a rich man. I'm not a regular guy who also has money. I'm a rich man. And if you'd like to study any person who exhibits arrogance in any sense, there's this delusional sense of taking credit for the attribute. It's not that I'm a regular guy and I sing beautifully. I am a great singer. It's not that I'm a regular guy and I play basketball very well. I am a great ball player. I am a different sort of person than you. I am that. And what happens is that I identify with that attribute. Would you like to know how people love money? It's only because of one reason. The money defines me. You see, more money means I'm richer. If I have $10 million, mm, that's good. But $100 million means I'm even bigger. Do you know what I'm worth? I'm now worth $100 million. And then if I get to a billion, do you know what I'm worth? You see, it's only once I identify with the money. It's only when I view it as a measure of me that I could love it. And then I have to love it. You know why? Because every one of us wants to be as big as we can. That's my neshama crying out to be bigger and bigger. And once I identify myself as a rich man, that's me. Now I need to be richer and richer and richer still because that's the essence of the neshama crying out to be bigger and bigger. Of course here misdirected because now I view myself as this rich man and now I need to be richer and richer and richer. And if you would like to know why it is that the minute you love money, it is guaranteed that you won't be satisfied, it's because you now identify as a rich man. Now, as a rich man, you need to be bigger and bigger because that's the very essence of the human. And if you'd like to understand this Rashi, I believe that's exactly what Rashi is saying. Yaakov Avinu said, Yeshli Kol, I have all. An arrogant person can never have all because I have a million, but that's not big enough for me. It's me. And I need more. I need 10 million. I need 100 million. I need a billion, and a billion's not enough, I need 10 billion. If that statement was made out of arrogance, he could never have said, I have all. He would have said, like Asa said, I have a lot, I have an abundance, I have a tremendous amount. I don't have it all. I can't possibly have enough. There wasn't arrogance in that statement, and Rashi says, that's how he said it. 
Hashem gave me a gift. Hashem gave me everything. Everything cannot be said out of arrogance because an arrogant man never has enough. An arrogant man identifies with the money. An arrogant man needs more and more and more. And if Yaakov Avinu said, I have all, it wasn't said with arrogance because an arrogant man can never have enough, can never have all. Esau, on the other hand, said it out of arrogance. I have an abundance. Oh, I have a lot. I could use more. Double would be even better. But that wasn't Yaakov. And that difference is a mighty, mighty big difference. And let's circle back to the main question that we've been dealing here. And that is, why can't man find happiness? It is a big business in this country. And for the past 50 years, even in the field of psychology, there's been tremendous innovations in the field of positive psychology, meaning mankind has realized, okay, you can cure depression, very nice. You can help people with anxiety and OCD, that's great. But what are you doing to make me, the average person, happier? And there's tremendous inroads now, tremendous up, tremendous attempts to find ways to make people happy. And it just doesn't work. And no matter how many books are written about it, no matter how many courses, no matter how many seminars, it just doesn't work. And all of the pop psychology and all of the great studies just doesn't work. And why not? Would you like to understand why not? It's really quite simple. I want you to imagine the following. Imagine that you're in the psychologist's office and a man walks in stark naked, painted brown, head to toe, with a fish hook in his cheek. And he says, doctor, I need help. Sit down. What is it? Well, doctor, I, 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 think, I think I'm a worm. I think I'm a worm. I, I, I'm a worm, doctor. I'm a worm. Oh, I, I see. I see. So, uh, so what's the problem? What's the problem? I, I, I'm a worm, doctor. I'm a worm. I, I understand, but what's the problem? What's the problem, doctor? I, I, I live in a city, and it's all concrete, and there's nowhere for me to dig, and I can't get into the ground. The therapist thinks, well, I, say, hey, I have an idea. Move to the country. If you move to the country, there'll be lots of dirt, and then you could dig around, and you, you could be happy, Okay. Now, obviously, that conversation never happened, and obviously that advice would not make that man very happy because he's not a worm. And if a person walks into a psychologist viewing himself as a worm, the first job of the therapist is to set him straight. You're not a worm. You're a human being. Would you like to understand why man can't be happy? Because they view themselves completely askew, completely, utterly from a wrong perspective. You are not a worm. You are not a horse. And if you feed the horse and take care of all the horse's needs, but don't take care of your own needs, guess what? You're not going to be satisfied. You're not going to be happy. And all of the courses and all of the self-help books and fill aisles and aisles and write 75,000 books, write 75 million books, it's not going to help because you're misunderstanding the essence of the human. And the reason why that's very, very relevant for us is because we discussed previously one of the great cultural myths that makes man so happy. The first of the cultural myths that makes man so unhappy is more money equals more happiness. Oh, if I only had more money, then I'd be happy. Oh, it'd be wonderful, it'd be wonderful, wonderful. And we discussed the fact that that obviously doesn't work, even from a secular standpoint that's understood now and extremely well documented that it doesn't work. And more money does not equal more happiness. Obviously, the lottery dis studies that we discussed, basic satisfaction with life survey. Even though domestic capital per, per person in the United States doubles every 20 to 30 years, there's no increase in happiness. When they measure from country to country, despite tremendous differences in material possessions and wealth, they don't find correlating differences in happiness. And it's become very, very accepted within, again, positive psychology that money doesn't make you happy. So why is it then that as a culture, we still buy into it? So again, as we discussed, it's a wonderful theory. The problem is that marketing and advertising in particular doesn't agree with that theory. And if you're not sure that I'm right, listen to the words from a Lexus ad. Whoever says that money doesn't buy happiness doesn't know where to shop. And we are bombarded constantly with unending messages 
what you need to be happy is more, more material goods, more possessions, and more than anything, more money, money, money. And as much as we intellectually understand that money doesn't meet my inner needs, as much as we understand that money won't make me happy, we're sold it on a constant basis. More possessions will make me happier. More money will make me happier. And you have to fight against the culture itself. You have to fight against the Western civilization's pervasive advertising messages and what flows through the entire culture if you want to be happy. But that's the first cultural mistake that makes people fundamentally unhappy and prevents them from ever reaching happiness. But there's a second cultural mistake when it comes to money, a second cultural belief that's so pervasive that it's almost hard to imagine the impact it has. Would you like to know what that second one is? Here's the question. If I say to you, that man, he's successful. What does that mean? It means he has money. If I say he's very successful, that means he has a lot of money. How do you spell success? Money. M-O-N-E-Y is how you spell success. And it doesn't matter. His kids could hate him. His wife could divorce him. Every employee could be cursing him out. But if he's making a lot of money, he is a successful human being. He could be a failure as a human being, but rated a success. Why? Because we equate our self-worth with our net worth. <laughs> I'm worth $10 million. You know what I'm worth? I'm worth $100 million. And just watch when people walk in the room. Psst. You know, I heard he's worth a bill. Oh, my goodness. I heard he's worth $5 billion. Oh, my goodness. Whoa. Now, let's understand something from the basic basics of basics. If you attach a price tag to your name, whether it's 10 million, 100 million, a billion, 10 billion, you are selling yourself so short that it's incredible. Forget about the idea of selling a human being for any price. Any imaginable number that you would come up with does not equal the value of planet Earth. And the Torah tells us over and over, Hashem would have created the entire world for one human being. Your self-worth should be well beyond billions, well beyond anything, and it certainly shouldn't be tied to other people's approval, and certainly not to how much money you have in the bank. And as strange as it sounds, culturally, we have this sense that if I'm worth more money, then I am worth more, and my self-worth is tied directly to my net worth, and I believe that this is the second reason why mankind is destined in our world to be unhappy. You see, if my self-worth is directly tied to my net worth, and if I feel I'm worth $10 million and therefore I'm important, and if I'm worth $100 million now, I'm really important, do you know why I'm destined to be unhappy? Because I am not a worm. I got it all wrong. I'm not a rich man. I am a human being with many, many facets, many aspects to me. One aspect happens to be financially, how much money do I have in the bank? When this part, the body's put in the ground, the first question they ask me isn't, well, how much money do you, did you leave behind? Your Yorshim, your children, how much did you leave them? That is not the first question they ask. But more than that, if I view my self-worth tied to my net worth, then I'm viewing myself as a rich man. That's the definition of me. Well, guess what? I'm not that. I'm a human being with many, many parts, many needs, physical needs, emotional needs, psychological needs, and more than anything with the real needs of my neshama, real needs to grow, to accomplish, to change the essence of me. And I'd like to share with you one profound concept. If you need to be rich, if that's your need, I would like to share with you a very unfortunate piece of news. You are destined to be miserable. And I'll explain to you why. I need to be rich. This is what I need this. I need to be rich. Either way, I will be a misery. Why? 
First of all, it's very unlikely that I won't be rich. Do you know why? Because it's not up to me. Hashem gives wealth, and Hashem gives wealth for three reasons. You listen to Emuna in the workplace. We go through extensively why it is that Hashem gives money to some people at some times, but it's a gift from Hashem, and just because you need it, just because you want it, and even if you're talented and have a brilliant business mind and brilliant ideas, it doesn't in any sense guarantee, nor does it even make it likely that you're going to make a lot of money. I haven't been around that long, but I've been around long enough to have taught quite a number of years of high school guys, and they're now largely in the workforce, And I've seen it all the time. The brilliant, clever, talented guys, they're okay, they're making ends meet. And it's the guy in the back of the room, a regular guy who's phenomenally wealthy. And believe me, when I need funding for the schmooze, it's very rare that I'm going to the Aleph student, to the most brilliant guy, because usually they're barely able to make ends meet. But it's that guy who, I don't know, he's a nice guy, good guy, but not super talented, not super smart, who has more money than you could even envision or imagine. And the reason is quite simple. It's not based on you. It's not based on me. Hashem runs the world. And there are certain people that Hashem will give grant wealth to for certain reasons under certain conditions. So if you need to be rich, the first problem you may have is you may not be rich. You may not make it. You may work for 20 years, 30 years, sleep under your desk every night, be driven 15 hours a day working and working and working, and you may never get there. And guess what? You're destined to be miserable. You see, if I wake up in the morning and say, I, I need to be six for two. I, I need to be six for two. I, I need it. And this is what I need. And I pursue it. And I shoot for it. And, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be six for two. Well, there's a little problem. I, I'm not six for two. I'm five for ten. And no matter how much I need it, no matter how much I want it, it's not going to be. And if I need to be six for two and I'm not, well, guess what? I'm lacking. I'm needy. And I surely will not be happy. Because what I need at the core of my essence is to be six foot two, and I'm not. And if you need to be rich and you don't become rich, which again is quite likely, guess what? You are going to be unhappy. Let's even say you granted it. Let's even say you get in your own mind lucky. And Hashem says, yes, you are destined to be one of those people who are rich. And you, wow, a hundred million dollars. Great. This is awesome. I got it all. And now surely I will be happy. Because now I am the rich man. And now that I'm the rich man, let's go. But a funny thing happens. I am not a rich man. I am a human being with many needs, many desires. And even when I get that great wealth, so initially it's great, it's wonderful, it feels so good. But I wake up after a week or after a month or surely after a year and I'm empty inside. And it's no fun And I realize that as a human being, I'm a failure. And I'm not a worm. I'm not this rich guy, and therefore I'm satisfied with it because there's so much else in my life. There's so much else in me, and I need to grow more and more, but my need to grow is now money and money, and I need more money and more money. I'm unhappy as when I was poor, with more desire and more needs for money, and I'm so focused on that that I wake up in the morning with a sense of emptiness, a sense of dread. And if you'd like a formula for dissatisfaction, a formula to be unhappy, if you need to be rich, you are guaranteed to be miserable. Now Hashem wants us to be happy. And Hashem even wants us to experience wealth. And when I say wealth, I mean to say abundance of physical possessions. And if we train ourselves, to recognize how much Hashem gives us. We train ourselves to appreciate the clothing that we have, the food that we eat, the beautiful homes that we live in. If we compare ourselves to other generations and we recognize the abundance that we have, there will be a sense of happiness. But you see, it's happiness because I have everything that I need. Hashem takes care of me. Whatever I need, I have. I work hard because that's what Hashem wants. And she wants me to put on my ishtad list, so I go to work, and I'm very diligent and I'm very focused. And if I own a business, I set high goals and I'm, I pursue them. But I'm doing that because that's what Hashem wants. And if I succeed in a grand scale, that's great, but it doesn't define me. It doesn't say I am now it. I was granted money. Let me figure out what to do with it. Let me use it appropriately, but it's not me. It's something that I have. 
And if I have this understanding, I have everything that I need, I'm able to experience true wealth, true enjoyment from my possessions. I enjoy my clothing. I enjoy the music that I listen to. I enjoy the life that I lead because it's beautiful. I have all of my needs met. And I believe that's what Rashi is telling us about Yaakov Avinu. When Yaakov said, Yesh li kol, I have everything, it could not be coming from arrogance. Why? Because arrogance is this overinflated, overbearing, I need more and more and more. And to understand that, we need to understand some of these basics. How is it possible? Shlomo Melech tells us, if a person loves money, he won't ever be satisfied. Why not? A billion dollars is a lot of money. If I spend 10 million a year, 100, why is it not enough? Why isn't it enough? So the answer is understanding the essence of the human. There's a horse and there's a rider. And if you spend your life studying the horse and meeting the horse's needs, yes, the horse will be well fed, but there's a rider. That rider is you. And you will be malcontent. If you'd like to see the neshama at work, just look at man ever needing more and more and more, certainly more money, but it's more of everything. Man is never content. Every animal in the wild, give that animal its needs and it is satisfied. Give man all of his needs and he still needs more and more and different and better and a higher position and more honor and more this. Why? 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 Explains the Arachal Siddiq and that's the neshama. Because Hashem gave us that neshama to grow and just as the body was given needs, it needs food, it needs drink, so too the neshama I need I need to grow, I need to change the essence of me, I need to be great. And if you'd like to see that neshama functioning, just watch people who are uncontent. But that neshama, when it functions and isn't properly fed, also could lead to something else. You see, that need to be great is a voice that says, why aren't you great? I am great. Why aren't you greater? I am greater. You know who I am? I'm big and I'm important. I'm big. You know who I am? I am, I am, I am. And if you see a boastful, conceited, arrogant person, you're watching a person whose neshama is propelling him to greatness, and he's answering it. Is there some dysfunction in his personality? Could we call it, oh my God, obviously he's just, he's really just insecure. He's not insecure. He's extraordinarily in competition, he and himself. There's a voice within him that says, I need to be great. And he's trying to answer that voice by saying, I am great. And any inflation of the ego, any conceit stems from unmet greatness of man. And one more step we needed to understand, and that is how is it possible to love money? You can love what money buys. You can love honor because if I'm a lot of money, you give me honor. How could I love money? The way that I love money is when I become rich and I identify with the money, I'm now a rich man. As a rich man, I need more and more and more. I love money because it's me. I am a rich man. My $100 million in the bank is me. I am it and it is me. And of course, I love me. And of course, I love money because the more money is the bigger I am. And I need more and more and more. And that's why Shlomo Melech says, if you love money, you are destined to need more and more. You can love steak. You don't have to eat steak every night. You can eat it once a month. You can love tennis. You can play once a year. But if you love money, There's only one way you could love money if it defines you. Money is green and crumply. The only way you could love money is if it becomes the measure of success of you. It becomes you, and then you're the rich man, and of course you're never going to be satisfied. And once you're on that track, you're destined to be miserable. Miserable, why? Because if you love money, you are destined to be unhappy because you are not a worm. If you come to the psychologist... And you say you're a worm and he suggests that you go dig in the dirt. He's missing the fundamental needs of you and you'll never be happy. And if you view yourself as a rich man, if you define yourself as a rich man and I need more and more and all I need to be happy is just more money, you will never be happy because you're misunderstanding the essence of you. You're missing it. You're not a worm. You're not a horse without a rider. And you're not hitting half of the needs that you have. Hashem wants us to be happy, but you have to understand the human, you have to understand what makes us tick, and then you could have a sense of shlemus, of completion. All of my needs are met. Hashem takes care of me. I work hard because that's what Hashem wants, but Hashem takes care of me. And in that state, you can enjoy tremendous pleasures 
from the world. You can feel an inner sense of satisfaction because you're really growing. You understand life and you're leading life the way your creator wants you to.